What's up DIYers and pet lovers? Meet Gary. Gary needs a new terrarium because his last one broke during transport. So we're gonna go ahead and make him one. Actually, me. I'm gonna surprise my friend Paul with a brand new reptile enclosure made specifically for a bearded dragon. Since everybody liked the last one I made on my other channel so much, I figured I'd make a better, more economical, and much more documented version this time around. And then we're gonna go ahead and pack it up and give it to my friend Paul here and his family and see how Gary likes it. We'll compare and contrast prices and features that we add into this to see how we come out on top because ultimately this is cheaper for an 80 gallon plus tank that is what's needed for a dragon this size. We absolutely beat it. Pennies on the dollar in some cases and with some nice add-ons also. This is a very long and well-documented video as requested. So there are chapters you can scroll with your finger on the phone like this, or you can just click the description area below to click on the timestamp hyperlinks there in blue, and you can go right to your spot where you left off. But for starters, let's talk about actual parts you should avoid getting. Don't buy your lamps from PetSmart or anywhere, anything that's charging you 60, 70, $50, whatever. And you know what this was? This was $11. $11. They're the same thing. So get as many of these as you need over there. And the smaller ones are like seven bucks. What you can't skip on though is bulbs. We will be needing a basking bulb. We are getting a 150 watt basking bulb because it's a fairly large tank. If you don't, if you want like a less intense light down there, you can also look at ceramic heating bulbs. Avoid the red, the infrared heat lamps. Everybody Pretty much a unilateral consensus among the community not to use those. Also, we're gonna be using uh, thermometer and hydrometer. Those we did purchase at PetSmart, they were very reasonably priced for what they do. They are digital. Also, to be fair, the essentials kit for a brand new bearded dragon, meaning like a, a newborn or just, you know, a fairly small juvenile dragon, a 40 gallon tank is needed. And this thing has everything, the UVA, UVB, basking bulb, the structure, the feeding bowls, the substrate, you know, the light fixtures, all those things are in here. It's fairly reasonably priced, but if you're well beyond that and your dragon's getting bigger, or if you have a full grown dragon like in this video, an 80 gallon plus tank is needed. And that's where we're gonna start getting into materials for what we got here. First of all, we need at least two, maybe more if you wanna do it all the edges, but we're only gonna do the top and bottom. We're getting a 2.5, a two foot by five foot sheet of birch plywood. They have the specialty plywoods the farther you go into the hardware store. I'm using birch because that's what was recommended by the audience as not being toxic. They said that pine wood is toxic. We are also dealing at a time where wood is like 600% higher than it was. These uh, pine wood studs used to be only 50 cents, but they're now almost $4 per stud. So we are going to be obviously getting the pine. You can get um, any wood of your choice, but it will probably be substantially more as you get into the finer craftier woods in that section as we all know exist in hardware stores but it's up to you whatever you want to do but these will be fine these will be outlying and not exposed to the dragon and they're just going to be making up the structure of the frame and we'll show you that as the process goes on yep there's the price imagine what they're going to be next month also if you're looking for nice vented these are pretty good options in the hvac section or the roofing section you'll generally have options events like that at least if you get it like that uh, crickets can't crawl through the vents if you have a small mesh on the behind you can also go ahead and look at the chicken wire variants or the screening variants like this i mean there's likely an option of screening variants if you have a local metal shop next to you or if your local hardware stores carry it look for perforated metal because that's what we will be using for the bulk of this project we'll also be using plastic wood i would recommend the stuff in the tube or a very very big jar of the regular stuff we also try and this paint out for size because we've never used it before and it have heard good things about it you can also use non-adhesive shelf liner for your substrate as we've done that before although we're going to go a different route and use rigid core waterproof flooring and this is a bigger component, the plexiglass. We Last time we used regular glass, which is a huge pain. Plexiglass is so much easier and it's gonna allow us to do things that would be really hard to do with glass of equivalent size. We'll also be needing wood screws, wood glue, various sizes. We're gonna be using drywall screws like this. Perfect for the project. We're gonna need deburring or countersink bits. You will need at least one impact driver with impact rated uh, drill bits if you just want to do a one and done deal we are using perforated galvanized aluminum that we will later be priming and painting to match the color 
And as noted earlier, we will be using rigid core flooring that is waterproof, very easy to cut just like wood. It stacks together, it has a rubber backing on the bottom, which I think will give some forgiveness over time for the dragon. And we have a few other things going on, including these gas struts that we're gonna be using to prop up the major top door. This is to show you a lot of ideas that you can do. A lot of this is not necessary, but we kind of went overboard in some sections. We'll, um, you know, go more economic on other sections just to kind of give you a variation. So it's not just a plain structure, but something that's way more functional and makes a little bit more common sense than the average one that you'll find at a store. For starters, we have the first piece of birch plywood and we have the equivalent piece of plexiglass. We will be sizing and trimming off a little bit of the excess right there to make sure it fits inside the gaps once we put the one by two studs on each corner. These are the one by two studs. Let's open them up. The plexiglass is an exact two foot by five foot duplicate of the plywood top and bottom, but we're gonna to have to subtract the one inch gap or slightly less than one inch gap from those one by twos. We're gonna go ahead and try and trim it off. You can do this two ways. You can do this with a cutoff wheel of some sort to include a Dremel, but this leaves kind of a rugged edge. If you want a cleaner edge, you get a really good blade on a circular saw and it'll cut just as well if you go slowly and carefully. Actually, there's a much cleaner cut. Now for the real benefit of the plexiglass is you can drill through it. Try drill through glass without messing it up. Quite hard for the average person to do, but anybody can drill through plexiglass. So here we go. We drill the initial pilot holes, and that's just the start of the beginning. We want a flush mount for this glass to go ahead and go forth with nothing to catch that could actually injure any animal going into the terrarium. The way I see it, pan head screws aren't gonna cut it. We're gonna have to countersink everything and everything has to fit flush or this entire thing just isn't gonna work. So we go ahead and we buy deburring bits or countersink bits, whichever you fancy to call them. They all work the same. You get a set of three. We're using the smallest set right now because we're using small screws that will eventually attach this plexiglass to the wood. But we did this because right now we had it in its rawest form right on top of the floor. So we cut it to fit, but we won't be using this piece until way later in the project, almost to the end. So best to get it out of the way and put it somewhere safe. Now let's get down to the floor, to the bottom frame. Here are the measurements for all the studs that I cut. The longest ones go obviously on the longest sides from the bottom and then eventually on the top. We will be making four parallel frames. Since we have the project at its rawest form, we're gonna go ahead and pre-drill all the holes for the drywall screws. There will be several going into the bottom of it. So we have the board flipped over on top of the studs so we can go ahead and make pilot holes everywhere. Making pilot holes with a drill bit smaller than the actual screw itself and then honing them out with countersink bits. And then we're gonna go ahead and put it all together to see how it fits. Make sure, because there is no actual design, we are making the design so it's fairly raw. And this is what you have to kind of do when you have your own raw design. We countersink these now to hide the screw heads so we can fill them with wood putty later. Just to be sure, we're gonna go ahead and double check to see if the design is going to work according to plan. Because you know, sometimes you have an idea and it comes out great in your head and then when you apply it in real life, you just like, eh. So we're gonna go ahead and try it right now so you don't have to. And these are the screws we will be using. When you're installing those, you wanna install them on the lowest setting of your impact driver, or if you have a drill or an installation driver like this, you wanna use like a number two for the chuck setting. The lowest you can go or you'll crack the plexiglass. Now that we know that this is gonna work and it's gonna stand there and it's gonna be fairly okay, we're gonna go ahead and start cutting the rest of the pieces. I would have cut them last night, but I have neighbors that are a bunch of Karens who like to call the cops on me, bunch of jerks. It's all the snowbirds too. It's not like during the summer, those people are pretty chill, but it's the snowbirds. They call the cops on you. Anyways, now's the time to put it all together. You will need clamps and wood glue. And if you have a Craig joiner, 
you know, to make pocket holes. That's awesome. But if you don't want to buy that because you don't hardly do any wood projects like me, we're going to show you a way to get around that with just a drill bit or two like this. We're going to join all the 90 degree angles and we're going to make our own little pocket hole with a drill bit that is just as big enough to fit the pan head. You're going to drill in there just slightly into the stud. Then you're going to go and drill your pilot hole. Then you're going to go ahead and put your screw. Anybody with a fully functional brain can do this. Don't go buy a crack pocket hole jig because those things are expensive. And if you're only going to use it once, it's no point. I bought one. It's just been sitting in my garage for over a year. What a waste of money. If you notice when we're joining the eight vertical studs together, you're gonna to have to remember to pocket hole the inner ones before you do the outer sides or you'll just forget to do the pocket hole. So you gotta get it like right now. Also, you will have to glue one side of the stud. This one, that one you'll have to glue. And you'll also notice that there is a shorter area on that side than you're gonna to have to the adjacent stud that is facing on the short side and that will cause problems if you pre-drilled your holes too far in on your plexiglass like I did. So just noting that I failed earlier on, but I did it so you don't have to. So just remember that you're going to have to make your holes way out on the outer end of the plexiglass or you'll end up missing the stud. I also got excited and ahead of myself and forgot to 90 degree angle all of those vertical studs. And I pay for that later, which you will see. We also get around it. You know, we get around a lot of things, but I just like, you know, telling you guys because it becomes a problem later. This is all nice and strong. All the wood glue is dried. Everything else is dried. It's actually really light. By the time we were done with our last enclosure, it was obscenely heavy. Two people really needed to be able to pick that up. But I mean, assuming you have enough leverage, you could pick this thing up yourself. It's not going to weigh much more with the siding or the uh, plexiglass we're going to put in. The top might be the heavier thing. The top might be a little bit more complex, but that's fine. And now it's time to smooth this frame out. So if you got the cheap pine studs like we did, you'll notice that there's a ton of imperfections in the wood itself, even if you made all the cuts flawlessly, which I didn't. But now we're gonna make it look great. We're gonna start by sanding it. We're gonna use 220 grit sandpaper on an orbital sander, but if you have a palm sander, that'll work fine just as well you can also probably rent these tools i think home depot has a tool rental program um and you can also just go to like walmart and get like the heart tools that'll work fine on small projects like these i have all these tools because well i'm semi-professional not really obviously it's all diy stuff yeah i don't know if you can really call it diy or professional but whatever i try anyways here it is the plastic wood or wood putty if I had done this all over again, I would have got more and I would have got the tube. The tube would have squeezed right into those holes and crevices a little bit better without any air bubbles because I'm putting it all on with my finger like so. Uh, there's air bubbles. And then we'll pay for that later and we'll have to recode it a few times, but it'll all work out. But to save yourself headache, just spend the extra money and get the tube or get a lot of it and just gunk it on there with a trowel. Uh, once it's dried, um, we can go ahead and hit it with sandpaper again. Hit it all until it's nice and smooth. Then you'll see the parts that finished correctly. Then you'll see the parts that still need a little bit of attention. Then you gotta just go over it again. The putty dries very quickly, even in the cold. So at least that's a plus. Just go it, fake it till you make it. There will be some spots that are just problem spots and you'll feel like you won't be able to fix them and maybe you won't, but most of your project looks like this and you seamed up all those lines and all the imperfections and all the gaps and natural imperfections with the wood, then you did a pretty good job. Don't forget to stuff the holes that you countersank because that's why we countersank them so you wouldn't ever see the studs after we put it all together. We're gonna eventually paint and primer this entire section once we have the bulk majority of it assembled and hopefully you won't even see any of the marks. I've seen a lot of DIY videos where people try to make breathe holes and breathe vents and just breathable sides. And I'll tell you, I'm just not a fan of the enclosure that 
doesn't have enough ventilation. You can tell there's a stagnant smell inside the enclosure all the time. So we're gonna make most of this enclosure breathable. We're doing this by using perforated metal that we found from the metal shop. But you can use any of those alternatives that I showed you at the hardware store just the same. I just feel like this stuff's a little bit more stylish and it's gonna work a little bit better. And plus it was cheap. I got it at a scrap yard in a metal shop for 50 cents a pound. And also I was countersinking and putting in those just like I was putting it in for everything else. But later on, I found out that with a strong enough uh, stapler, you can actually just staple this to the wood. But it just saved me an immense amount of time because I'll tell you what, dr drilling all those holes have sucked really bad. Just if you get a stapler, use a stapler. After all that was in, I test fitted the plexiglass to make sure it would fit into the side. That way I could seal off the top with no worries. But when I put it on the top, I realized that it was slightly off. So I had to put a lot of buildup of the plastic wood once I had it secured to the top. And that stuck. See that little triangle, that speed square? Use that thing when you're lining up the vertical studs. That way your top will fit just like your bottom floor did. And you won't have to do this. I spent the rest of my night trying to bounce and level it out with wood putty. One thing we want to do before we go to bed is seal the floor. Give that epoxy a good dry time. We are using West Systems 105 Marine Epoxy. It's two part, but really any epoxy would do. Now you can get the Bondo resin from the hardware store and that will work as well. But you know, Marine Epoxy is kind of the best stuff out there. So we're gonna go ahead and put that here, let it penetrate, let it harden and let it cure overnight. So tomorrow when we go to finish this thing, it'll be ready. We're also using a trowel to evenly spread this. Do not try and spread it with your hand or with a popsicle stick, it will not come out even. You need a trowel. All right, so here it is in the morning. Pay no attention to all that wood putty. We take care of that later. Right now, check out the light fixture setup. This is the proposed setup, three across, the biggest one for the heat bulb, and it's gonna be sitting inside that aluminum sheet that I randomly had in my yard. You'll have to go get one if this is something you wanna do. But my bigger thing, my bigger contribution to this whole thing is how we do the lid. The lid is very important to me because it's the lid that I really hate on all the factory made terrariums out there. Just don't like them. I think it could be much better done and so we'll be doing that here. We start off by cutting out the top side. We leave about a two inch or two and a half inch gap. That's really to your choice, but we're gonna go ahead and cut that out and get it out of there. Then we use the same one by two studs we used to frame this entire thing together and we mount them underneath the lip and we secure them all the way along to make the framing in for the hatch. I install them all around at half the stud length to give it a three quarter inch lip. That the top seamlessly falls right into. We now get to the exciting part, which is that aluminum core, which we will then have to line up and cut another adjacent top piece out of the actual lid itself. So, you know, multiple cuts, but it's all worth it because if we do this right, the reason I'm using aluminum is because of its heat dissipation factors. If we use the steel sheet, it would not only be a lot heavier than its equivalent size of aluminum, but it also doesn't dissipate heat worth the crap. Neither does wood. In fact, wood's flammable, and I was always paranoid me in my last design. So this time we're gonna get it, rid of it completely. We're gonna use an aluminum top. We're gonna to secure the light fixtures to the aluminum from underneath. And when we do that, pretty much all heat will be dissipated through the aluminum panel, and almost none of it will ever touch the wood.
attach those light fixtures with 1 8 inch by half inch rivets, but you can attach it with any hardware, doesn't really matter. Now that I look at it, I'm slightly paranoid that, uh, you know, because it's a family and there's dogs and there's kids and I think they have a cat somewhere hiding, uh, you know, I just think that those light fixtures are really easy to kind of get damaged if it's just left out there without some sort of protection. So we're going to go ahead and take this scrap piece of 0 0.025 aluminum and bend it. It's pretty thin. It's about the thinnest you can really find. It's like paper. So we'll be able to bend it on a metal brake. We have a cheap brake from Harbor Freight that was about 50 bucks. And we're going to go ahead and use that to bend this. It's always a little sketch to use this thing. I mean, it just sits out in my backyard. There's no good place to put it. It just collects rust. But, you know, it's on these rare occasions that is useful. That's why I still have it. It is just wide enough and long enough for me to get all this in there. You got to tactfully bend it from each side and make sure you have enough of an overhang to clear the back of it. Or you can't get, you know, adjacent bends in a zigzag fashion like this. Harbor Freight also has one that I think is four times more expensive and likely a lot better, but I'm cheap. You also don't need to make this out of aluminum. You can make it out of wood and you could just seam it up just like we seamed up that entire frame. But like I said, I just had this in my yard, so why not? It's not like it was doing any good just sitting there. One side came up higher because I actually had a sense to measure it, to mark it, remark it on the bottom, and then I didn't do it over here. And I just winged it, and so you pay for winging it. Seriously, not great, but whatever. I actually think this will look really good. We're probably gonna paint this black. If we have to put some more underframing under here, we could, but I think it's fairly unnecessary because we're not gonna do much else. That really is just a shroud to protect the top of the heads and kind of clean the wires up. We pour it here and run all the wires to that. That'll look cleaner. Let's do that. That'll look pretty cool. Most all the major parts are done and before we can assemble it all together and finish it, we have to paint it. So for the aluminum, we will have to use self etching primer, which before we even do that, we'll have to sand and clean it all off. So it's a nice paintable stickable surface for the primer to do its thing. If you're wondering why we can't just use any old primer, it's because not a whole lot of things really like to stick to aluminum. I can't tell you why. Any primer will stick right to steel, but not to aluminum. So just use that stuff, or if you have better stuff out there for aluminum, then use that. But that's just my suggestion. The easiest and most abundant stuff you can find at the hardware store is self edging primer. Now we have to paint the wood. So let's go ahead and get a damp rag and wipe all the dust off, make sure it's clean of impurities. And I really just want to go and paint it right now, but I forgot you have to prime wood. So unlike uh, the problem with aluminum where nothing wants to stick to it, Wood will soak up everything. And because of that, if we don't prime it, it'll just keep in soaking in the paint, soaking in the paint. So, you know, we're just gonna have to prime it. So we're, I don't actually have wood primer, I forgot. So I'm using uh, this paint primer mix, which what we're trying to do is just clog up the pores of the wood, make sure that, you know, it has a, a favorable surface for us to paint on. That way it doesn't just keep soaking in the paint and, you know, all the problems associated with that. Once the primer dries on the aluminum, we have to kind of rub it up with a scotch pad and then clean it again. And then, then we can paint it. We're going to use Rosolian Professional black paint. Bear in mind, it's windy out here. It, I have terrible conditions to paint today. It was just like, just my luck. The only windy day when I was going to paint, you know, the next day was like glass, but whatever. We go at it. Wow. 
I was quite impressed with the Rust-Oleum outdoor paint. Like when you were shaking it, it felt physically heavier and thicker than the normal spray paint. So you could tell it was going to come out, you know, however it was going to come out pasty and wet. Um, so the first coat was a little troublesome and worrying, but as we went to the second coat and definitely by the third coat, we had a nice solid looking solid platform. It says after three days of curing, it's machine washable. So it's pretty tough stuff. It's exactly what I needed. And I think, I think it matches their house. It could also not match their house, in which case, you know, fail, but at least it looks good to me. Like I would put that in my house. Pretty good stuff. So now that we accomplished that and we got those cheap pine studs and all that wood putty to look not like it did, what are we gonna do about the inside? We have to address that. I thought about painting it the same gray color as the exterior, but then I thought how that would just take away from the actual lighting. The darker color inside, the least lighting you're gonna get into the compartment, it'll just soak it up. So we're gonna to have to paint it with something lighter. I was gonna use a flat white, and then I just, I think it'll be too bright. So an off white, kind of almost tan egg color. I had this random can of Krylon um, just sitting in my little hazmat area. So we're gonna go ahead and use that because it's, you know, eventually I think these paint cans expire. You gotta use them. All right, so here it is. The inside's prepped. I think that off eggshell, like it's pretty nice. It's almost a tan, but not quite. It's more of an off-white. It'll look nice when the lights actually hit it. The gray we're going to use is going to soak too much light up. It's going to be too dark in there. But this will actually help reflect. So far, it's going pretty good. Light fixtures are in their spots. The grommet's in its spot. Now we just have to put the hinges, and then we're going to be putting gas struts to prop this. It's a very heavy, heavy door. So we have to be using some spring props to prop it up. Note, we're only using these piano hinges because they're in my garage and I needed to use them. But you could use these if you'd want. They're right there in the hardware section. Just pick them right up and just right next to the hardware section in Lowe's, there are any number of hinges for drawers and cupboards and fences and all of those will work. Right now we are using a one inch drill bit to drill a kind of a, a guide hole and so we can countersink them correctly. If these are any little bit off, the whole hinge shifts. It is the most annoying thing. So, you know, it takes a little bit of time to do this right, but eventually they all line up and it opens up like it's supposed to. If the hinge shifts, you will know immediately when you try to open it. The awesome thing is we now have a fully functional top lid that opens up and holds the light fixtures all in one. So no overhanging light fixtures, no having to worry about if the lamp's going to fall on the ground and break. None of that BS. But there's one thing, this is heavy and you don't want it to fall on you or your pet. So we will be installing gas spring props, gas struts, whatever you want to call it. We had to make uh, the ball joints to a piece of angle so they would offset, but you could buy offset ball joints for gas struts all day on Amazon for fairly cheap. I'm just, we're out of time and I need this thing done. So that's why we did this, but it's really a waste of aluminum. We're gonna go ahead and cut this up and just get it done so we can go ahead and install them. These are 22.5 pound gas struts and get them on Amazon all day. These are 100N, so we're at, right at or over 20 pounds of force. We're gonna probably need two of these, given how big the lid is. I think probably too much force, we can go down to 50 in, but right now we're gonna try 100. They come with hardware, they come with those ball joints. Put the ball joints, the stock ball joint, which is meant to kind of go inside a wall, but since we obviously we had to offset with that deal, and they give you this one. This one, this one we'll be using up top. A good rule of thumb for install on these is when you install the top, make sure the actual shaft length doesn't go above the hatch itself, that only three fourths of it actually goes up. The, the bottom fourth needs to hang below the entry point. And that way, when you install underneath, you'll ensure that you don't run out of travel at full install. If you do run out of travel, it's not a big deal. You just gotta readjust the bottom one or the top, whichever one you wanna do. But I would try to run it is far up and you get the most usable travel you can. That way you get the full power of the strut. 
We are using a 122.5 pound gas strut that we got off Amazon. You can get them in 50 N, which is only 10 pounds, 40 N, which is eight pounds and so on. But really 50 N is too light for this particularly big lid. In fact, it's too big for just one of these props. We're gonna have to use two. Total of 40 pounds of pressure or a little bit over that. And that should ensure that the hatch stays up and it doesn't accidentally get knocked over and then chop your animal in half or hurt your arm while cleaning, you know, just for security. If it's too overpowered, the struts are too overpowered, you'll know your hatch will bind, it'll squeak. And you know to like go down to a lesser end rating of the strut. Okay, that feels a lot better. It's gonna ensure that if the lid gets tipped a little bit, that it's not just gonna automatically fall. It's got some resistance until you push it over halfway and then it wants to stay up automatically. With the just one strut, you really had to kind of prop it all the way up and then it even then it was a little questionable, but it stayed. But now that's fairly good security. The hatch also doesn't bind. Now for a handle. I forgot to buy a handle. You can also find handles just like this. Well, not like this. This is a boat handle that I have from an old project, but handles like that you can get right there in the cupboard section, in the hinge section. It's all like one piece um, for projects just like this. Fast forward, we install the light bulbs. And so it's working out pretty good. Got We have a 13 watt on the far end, which we want to be the coolest part of the tank, a 26 watt, and then a 150 watt basking bulb. The other two are UVA, UVB. You need a mixture of both. And of course you need a heating fixture. We talked about the lighting options at the very beginning. Um, so this is what we'll be willing to try out. We're running an extra hefty basking bulb because of the amount of the vents. One thing that I will say about the initial enclosures without all the vents like this is that they will hold heat better, but obviously the stagnant air. So we are hope for better breathability inside the enclosure while still providing the same amount of optimal heat that the dragon needs to do its daily functions and be healthy. Okay, so this looks all nice and handy and convenient, but the aluminum insert on top, is it doing what it's supposed to do? Is it keeping the lamp heat away from the wood lid? So right now it's a little cold outside, so it's a little off-putting, but when I put my hand around just to fill around the aluminum in and of itself, the heat dissipation is very good. I mean, it, you can't feel hardly any heat, to the point where it's not even an issue. I don't see any issue at all. The only thing we have left is what are we gonna use for substrate? Meaning, you know, the floor. This time I went with rigid core flooring, 100% waterproof, because for one, it looks really good. Two, it was waterproof. And three, it's a little bit more permanent and better. We did use non-adhesive shelf liner. Um, and the other one, there is good stuff of it and there's other stuff that's not great with it. It doesn't do great underneath a heat lamp for long periods of time. Eventually it starts to kind of have an od odorous plastic, you know, at, not great. I'm thinking this stuff will hopefully do a little bit better. Um, I know there's recommendations about tile and not having tile. Um, there is a rubber backing on the bottom of this. I think will give some comfort and uh, forgiveness on, I guess, the joints of the dragon. That's a concern. Really, I don't know if there's a better deal. I just, we need something that's gonna be nice and waterproof and something you can just wipe and clean seamlessly. And that seems to be this stuff. Really, it's made that because it's flooring. We're gonna go ahead and stick them in. They slide in and interlock. There's no glue, there's no adhesive. They're actually, it's pretty nice. It cuts just like wood and it's plastic. So it's very, very easy to shelf. We just lined out four of these and then trace the inner side and then put those measurements right on there and then just cut again. I also wanna note that there's always a clearance section for this stuff and I got the cheapest clearance stuff that was right there at Home Depot. And now for the reason that I got plexiglass. It was gonna make my project so much easier because for one, it flexes, two, it's safer. I mean, there's really no way that it loses to glass other than that over time, you'll get little micro scratches, but you can just unflex it and reflex in a new piece and. You know, you can replace it if it's really, if it's bothering you that much. I mean, the benefits of having this over a glass front like that is pretty exponential in terms of weight, installation, all those things. So I was banking on that as a big part of the project to get that all done. So we just kind of loosen up a little bit of the edges. Then we install our screws. That way we can pull it off fairly seamlessly when we get to it. We pull off the inside 
just to see what it would look like in the inside and we're gonna leave the outside for Mr. Paul when he sees the enclosure. Also, I wanna talk about these. These are pretty necessary and they are pretty reasonably priced over at PetSmart, one of the only reasonably priced things I figure. So we got them and installed them. We saw the hydrometer in the middle and we saw the thermometers on each side. And so you get a pretty accurate measurement, especially if you put the water dish right in the middle of the cage, which is what is recommended by most. So let's get it over there and see what it's like in action. Yeah, I did. I did. That is so cool. Well, you have to light it up. So Gary seems to be enjoying the basking bulb and just kind of lying around and eventually kind of moves around to a bigger, higher spot. And so it makes us believe that it's it's a pretty good setup. Definitely was better than his interim setup before we got this new permanent one in. So we hope this video was helpful to you. If you like it, please share it, subscribe, comment, do all those fun things that'll help this channel grow and trend because that's what we do it for. And we also did it for Gary here. And we hope this helps you for ideas on how to make an economic enclosure along with some innovative ideas in the mix. And though some of these things were expensive, just know that it's always cheaper to get it done DIY and also more rewarding. Thank you.